me thank uh, Senator Wicker for uh, starting us off on, on the discuss discussion of what's happening in Russia today. I rise today, along with some of my colleagues, to bring attention to the growing issue of human rights violations in Russia, typified by the case of Sergei Magnitsky. Just last week, as part of a bilateral presidential commission, Attorney General Holder met with Russian Minister of Justice to discuss the rule of law issues. That same week, Russian officials moved in their criminal prosecution of Sergei Magnitsky. Mr. President, I remind you that Mr. Magnitsky has been dead for more than two years. Last May, I joined with Senator McCain and Senator Wicker and 11 other of our senators from both parties to introduce the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act. We now have nearly 30 co-sponsors, and I urge more to join us and look at ways to move forward on helping halt abuses like this in the future. After exposing the largest known tax fraud in Russia history, Sergei Magnitsky, a Russian tax lawyer working for an American firm in Moscow, was falsely arrested for crimes he did not commit and tortured in prison. Six months later, he became seriously ill and was consistently denied medical attention despite 20 formal requests. And then on the night of November 16, 2009, he went into critical condition. But instead of being treated in a hospital, he was put in an isolation cell, chained to a bed, beaten by eight prison guards with rubber batons for one hour and 18 minutes until he was dead. Sergei Meditsky was 37 years old, left behind a wife, two children, and a dependent mother. While the facts around his arrest, detention, and death have been independently verified and accepted at the highest levels of Russian government, those implicated in his death and the corruption he exposed remain unpunished in positions of authority, and some have even been decorated and promoted. Following Manitsky's death, they have continued to target others, including American business interests in Moscow. These officials have been credibly linked to a similar crimes and have ties to Russian mafia, international arms trafficking, and even drug cartels. The money they stole from the Russian budget was laundered through a network of banks, including two in the United States. Calls for investigation have fallen on deaf ears. In an Orkvalian turn of events, the law enforcement officers accused of Manitsky, by Manitsky and those most involved in his murder are, uh, are uh, and those that are accused by Manitsky and those most complicit in his murder are moving to try him for the very tax crimes they committed. Think of the irony here. He exposed corruption in Russia. As a result, he was arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Now, those who perpetrated the crime on him are charging him after his death with the crimes they committed. We cannot be silent. And one of the most articulate voices in the United States Senate on this issue has been Senator Wicker, who is the head, leading Republican on the Helsinki Commission. And I applaud him for his efforts not only on bringing the Manitsky abuse to public attention and what's happening in Russia, but in many other areas where human rights violations have occurred. And I'd be glad to allow my, my colleagues some time on this issue. Well, uh, I thank my colleague from Maryland. And, and yes, indeed, there are other cases of, of human rights uh, violations, not the least of which I have highlighted uh, time and again uh, on this Senate floor, uh, being the, the cases of Mikhail Hordakovsky and Platon Lebedev. Uh, each is an appalling story, just as the one Senator Cardin pointed out with regard to Mr. Magnitsky a story about the criminality and corruption within the Russian government itself. My colleagues and I will continue to speak out about these cases in the hope that attention will inspire change. Uh, I look forward to the day when a focus of a floor statement can be about the progress we've made with Russia. It's something my colleague and I dearly look forward to. Uh, we, we look for the day when Russia begins to uphold democracy human rights and the rule of law. But unfortunately, today is not the day. In recent months, an overwhelming number of headlines out of Russia 
uh, focus on the Russian spring. Opposition groups, citizens, and in many cases the mainstream media have reacted to moves by the Russian regime they view as no longer acceptable. On September 24 of last year, President Medvedev struck a deal that would clear the way for his predecessor, Vladimir Putin, to run next month for a third presidential term. Uh, as the Wall Street Journal noted in an opinion piece last December, even the most thick-skinned citizens saw that turning the presidency into the object of a private swap and made a mockery of the Constitution. Russia's fraudulent parliamentary elections in December further deepened the political crisis and affirmed the erosion of democracy. Secretary Clinton, our Secretary of State, called them neither free nor fair. So this is a bipartisan uh, denunciation of the process. Ob observers have claimed that 12 to 15 percent of the votes were falsified in favor of the United Russia Party. According to most analysts, improvement is not expected in the upcoming presidential election this March. But these corrupt actions uh, have not been ignored. On December 10, more than 60,000 Russians took to the streets of Moscow in protest. Similarly, on February 4th, some 120,000 citizens from across the political spectrum braved below zero weather during a pro-democracy march in central Moscow. Their demands were clear. Release political prisoners like Hordakovsky and Lebedev. Allow opposition parties to register, hold free and fair elections, and pledge not to give a single vote to Putin on March 4th. Similar rallies were held across in, in small towns across Russia. We can be glad for the call for reform, and we're glad that it's growing louder. According to a February poll by Russia's independent uh, Levada Center, 43% of Russians now support pro-democracy protests. Additional protests are already scheduled for later this month. Now, specifically, let me once again underscore the horrific facts about Sergei Magnitsky, because it needs to be heard, and perhaps some of our colleagues were not listening the first time. Um, in the midst of this public outcry and demand for democratic process, the news out of Russia with regard to Mr. Magnitsky is almost unbelievable. Just last week, it was revealed that the police in Russia plan to retry the tax evasion case of the late Sergei Magnitsky. As many of my colleagues are aware, Mr. Magnitsky is already dead. He died in Russian detention more than two years ago. He was a lawyer and a partner in an American-owned law firm based in Moscow. He was married with two children, as my friend has said. His clients included the Hermitage Fund, which is the largest foreign port portfolio, portfolio investor in Russia. Through his investigative work on behalf of Hermitage, Mr. Magnitsky discovered that Russian Interior Ministry officers, tax officials, and organized criminals worked together to steal $230 million in public funds, orchestrating the largest tax rebate fraud in the history of the Russian Republic. In 2008, Mr. Magnitsky voluntarily gave sworn testimony against officials from the Interior Ministry, Russian tax departments, and the private criminals whom he found had perpetrated the fraud. A month later, an arrest was made, and the person arrested was Mr. Magnitsky himself. He was placed in pretrial detention, and he was held without trial for 12 months. While in custody, he was pressured and tortured by Russian officials, hoping he would withdraw his testimony and falsely incriminate himself and his client. But he refused to do so, and his conditions worsened and his health worsened, Mr. President. He spent months without medical care. Requests for medical examination and surgery were denied by Russian government officials. On November 13, 2009, Mr. Magnitsky's condition deteriorated dramatically, 
Doctors saw him on November 16 when he was transferred to a Moscow detention center that actually had medical facilities. Yet instead of being treated at those facilities immediately, he was placed in an isolation cell, handcuffed, beaten until he died. In the months following his death, Russian officials repeatedly denied facts concerning his health condition. The Russian State Investigative Committee claimed that Magnitsky was not pressured nor tortured, but died naturally of heart disease, and his death was nobody's fault. This is from the Russian government. Since then, Mr. Magnitsky's, since Mr. Magnitsky's death, two subsequent reviews have helped clarify some of the facts. In late December of 2009, the Moscow Public Oversight Commission, an independent watchdog mandated under Russian law to monitor, monitor human rights, issued its conclusions on this case. And this independent Russian Oversight Commission stated that in detention, Magnitsky had been subjected to torture, physical and psychological pressure, that he was denied medical care, and that his right to life had been violated by the Russian state. The conclusions were sent to the Russian General Prosecutor's Office, the Russian State Investigative, Investigative Committee, the Russian Ministry of Justice, and the Presidential Commission. None of these agencies have responded to the report's conclusions. Now, more recently, a second finding was issued by the Russian President's Human Rights Council. It issued its independent expert findings on the case. The report found that Magnitsky was arrested on trumped-up charges, yet they're being brought forward again after his unfortunate death. In breach of Russian law, and in breach of the European Human Rights Convention and that his prosecution was unlawful, that he was systematically denied medical care, that he was beaten in custody, which was approximate cause of his death, and that his medical records were falsified, and that there is an ongoing cover-up and resistance by all government bodies to investigate. Mr. President, Senator Cardin and I and Senator McCain and others have no choice but to continue coming to this floor, continue using every forum that we can possibly use to bring these facts to light. And, uh, and I, I, I would yield back. I've, I've taken quite a bit of our time with my prepared statement. I yield back to my friend uh, from Maryland, uh, as to uh, any other thoughts that he might have, uh, I want to commend his leadership with regard to the legislation. Do I understand now, uh, Senator, uh, that we have uh, some 30 co-sponsors? That is correct. And uh, again, I, I thank you for your leadership and I thank you for your comments. We have 30 co-sponsors of, of the Manitsky legislation uh, that I'm going to be encouraging more of our colleagues to join us in co-sponsorship. I want to talk a little bit about that, if I might. But let me just underscore the point that Senator Wicker pointed out. Mr. Manitsky died two years ago through crimes that were perpetrated on him that have been well documented. The Russian Federation is now charging him after his death with those crimes. After his death. Not even in Stalin time did they try people after they died. This is the first time in Russia history that a man has been tried after his death. Further, they have summoned Mr. Manitsky's widow and ailing mother as witnesses against their husband and son. This is a new chapter in brazen impunity. An editorial last week in the Financial Times observed that if he's convicted, and I'm going to quote from the Financial Times, the accused's citizenship could be revoked, he could be exiled, forced to die somewhere else, end quote. That might be funny if it wasn't real. If it wasn't enough, Russian Justice Minister recently proposed that the United States and Russia conclude an extradition 
treaty. Legal farces like what we have seen in the case of Sergei Magnitsky or many others bring reasonable people to only two conclusions, both of which are profoundly disturbing. Either senior leaders are not the ones running the country or the senior leadership is complicit in these outrages. The Minsky story sounds like a Hollywood thriller, but his case is real, and the rampant corruption, violence, and lawlessness does exist in the Russian government. His cause has become a global campaign for justice. As Senator Wicker pointed out, the popular opinion in Russia is on the side of justice. There's been over 4,000 stories on Sergei Magnitsky since his death in Russia. We know from countless historical cases, such as the death in police custody of the anti-apartheid activist Steve uh, Bicko in 1977, that one person's life and sometimes death can change the system. And since we're now living on the Internet, such change often comes much faster than expected. Mr. President, I'm going to comment about the legislation that I filed and the need for us to consider that. But, but I noticed that Senator Shaheen is on the floor. Senator Shaheen is, is a member of the Helsinki Commission. She also chairs the European Subcommittee on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and has been an outspoken champion on behalf of human rights. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm pleased that she's here, and I'd like to give her an opportunity. Uh, I see that she's prepared to talk about this issue. Mr. President. Senator from New Hampshire. Um, thank you very much, Senator Cardin. I I'm really want to thank you and Senator Wicker for your efforts today coming down to the floor to raise this important human rights issue. As you say, um, if, if we didn't see the facts, we would believe this was fiction, what's going on in Russia today. Um, but I think these efforts are particularly important given what's happening today in Russia. Um, we've seen historic demonstrations on the streets of Moscow over the last several months. Ordinary Russian citizens, fed up with nearly a decade of corruption, uh, have courageously taken to the streets to demand that their voices be heard. The fraudulent Duma elections and the cynical and manipulative decision by Prime Minister Putin to return to the presidency have reawakened civil society throughout Russia. As a leading Russian social activist, Alexei Navalny wrote from his jail cell following the peaceful December demonstrations, quote, we all have the only weapon we need and the most powerful. That is the sense of self-respect. Today, as we call for justice for human rights abuses in Russia, we also stand with those brave Russian citizens who have risked so much in calling for their rights to be respected just as Sergei Magnitsky did. As we've seen throughout this last year of upheaval around the globe, the rising voice of a public driven to peaceful protest can be deafening. Prime Minister Putin and his regime would be wise to listen to the people of Russia. I also want to echo what Senators Wicker and Cardin have said about their the importance of passing the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act. There are now tw 28 Senate co-sponsors. I am one of those co-sponsors and I'm proud to be. Um, and I want to associate myself with what you all have said on the floor of the Senate today. The case of Mr. Magnitsky is a tragic one. He was falsely imprisoned, beaten, denied medical care, and ultimately killed, as you all have so eloquently explained. And to this day, no one has been held accountable for his tragic and unnecessary killing. We stand here today to press for accountability in Mr. Magnitsky's death. However, I think it's important, important for us to reiterate that this is more than simply a question of one man's tragic case. The State Department's human rights report for this year describes numerous violations as you said so well, Senator Cardin, attacks on journalists, physical abuse of citizens, harsh prison conditions, politically motivated imprisonments, and other government harassment and violence. 
The European Court of Human Rights has issued more than 210 judgments holding Russia responsible for grave human rights violations, including abductions, killings, and torture in Chechnya and throughout the Northern Caucasus. There are many more cases like Magnitsky, which is why the bill before us is so important. It seeks to ensure that no human rights abusers in Russia or elsewhere in the world are granted the privilege of traveling to this country or utilizing our American financial system. As chair of the Subcommittee on European Affairs, I was pleased to preside over a hearing on your Magnitsky, our Magnitsky bill, and on the state of human rights in Russia. I, I want to thank Chairman Kerry for helping to make that hearing possible. During the hearing, we had a very constructive conversation with State Department officials, and we heard unanimous support for the legislation from an impressive panel of human rights activists and Russian experts. We've also received letters, and I'm going to introduce these letters into the record, from leading human rights and civil society leaders in Russia calling on the Senate to pass the Magnitsky Bill. Around the world, governments are also taking up this important call. The European Parliament, Canada, the Netherlands are considering similar pieces of legislation. And this summer, the U.S. State Department barred dozens of Russian officials from traveling to the U.S over their involvement in the death of Magnitsky. I want to commend the administration, and particularly Secretary Clinton, for her strong words condemning the recent fraudulent elections in Russia. But despite all these efforts, there is more we can do to support human rights and civil society, freedom of expression in Russia. Passing the Magnitsky bill this year is one of them. In the midst of an election year, at a time of difficult partisanship, I believe this is one effort, as we've seen so well from Senator Cardin and Senator Wicker here today, this is one effort that both sides of the aisle can agree on. And we stand here unambiguously today in support of rule of law, democracy, and respect for human rights in Russia. And I hope that our colleagues in the Congress and at the State Department will work constructively in the months ahead to pass this critical piece of legislation. And um, Mr. President, Senators, before I yield the floor, I also think it's important to call attention to the particularly egregious act that Russia committed in recent days before the United Nations when they vetoed the Security Council resolution aimed at halting the ongoing violence in Syria. Today, more than 25,000 people have fled Syria. More than 7,000 innocent Syrians have died at the hands of President Assad. And despite Syria's growing isolation, Russia continues to harbor and arm the Syrian re regime. This is unacceptable, and I think our passage of the Magnitsky bill will send a very strong sign to Russia that not only in the Magnitsky case and other human rights abuses, abuses in country are they going to be held accountable, but their actions internationally will also make them accountable to the international community. So again, thank you to Senator Cardin and Senator Wicker for your leadership on this issue. I'm very pleased and honored to be able to join you in making this fight. Well, Mr. President, we are, we are honored to uh, have Senator Shaheen join us, and I know there are others who would like to be here today. We're here to tell the sordid facts of this case, but we're also here because change can occur. Uh, if this were completely hopeless, uh, what would be the point of this exercise? Um, change occurred in Eastern Europe, and, and I must admit there was a time in, in my younger days when I doubted it would ever occur. And uh, I, my hat is off to the intrepid members of, uh, of the Public Oversight Commission who, who had the courage to issue a report critical of their government to uh, the Russian President's Human Rights Council. So voices are being heard. There is a, a thread of truth coming from uh, the, the uh, almost iron curtain of, of, uh, of authoritarianism that we've reverted to in Russia. Uh, the senator from New Hampshire mentioned other organizations in Russia, and I'm glad she has inserted those letters into the record. Uh, 
I also would point out that, that I, I have to applaud the international reaction. In December, the European Parliament passed a resolution recommending an EU-wide travel ban, an asset freeze, for officials tied to Mr. Magnitsky's death. Um, but we need to act as a Senate and uh, as a Congress. And so I'm calling on every senator within the sound of my voice today, Mr. President, uh, every legislative director dealing with uh, defense and foreign policy issues, once again to look at, uh, at the Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act. Uh, I will tell my friend from New Hampshire uh, that the number is now up to 30. Uh, we learned uh, on the floor today from Senator Cardin. So we have 30 senators involved. We really ought to have a majority of senators before the end of this day if people would just take the time to look. Again, I, I join her in congratulating the Foreign Relations Committee on, on uh, bringing further light to this. I thank the State Department, uh, as she said, and, and I would simply conclude my portion of this by, by saying recent events make it even more important that the Foreign Relations Committee and that this Senate take up and pass this legislation. I urge all of my colleagues to consider joining us on this legislation. Let me, if I might, uh, Senator Shaheen, I want to thank you for your comments, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your leadership. The hearing that you held on the Sergei Magnitsky bill was very, very helpful. First of all, I think it answered the question of why we should care. Now, we all understand America's leadership on moral issues, and the world looks to America to stand up against these fundamental abuses of human rights. So that in and of itself is a reason for us to act. But it was also apparent from the hearings that these criminals, these violations in Russia involve our financial institutions. So we are talking about the integrity of American companies to be able to deal and do business internationally. So we, it's not only the moral issue that we have a right to speak out. And as my two colleagues on the floor know, under the commitments that we all signed on to in the Helsinki in 1975, we have committed ourselves to basic human rights and the obligation of any member state to question the conduct in another state. And Russia is a signator of the Helsinki Final Act. The United States is a signator. So we have a responsibility uh, to, to uh, bring this to the attention. But we can do more. You know, what can we do about this? Well, there are many aspects of the Meninsky tragedy that are difficult for us to pursue here in the United States. You know, it can't be our criminal justice system. It's got to be the Russian uh, system that has to be reformed to deal with this. But there are steps that we can take. And the legislation that we all have filed recognizes that the right to visit America is a privilege granted by the United States. The visa is a privilege. There's no guaranteed right to come to America. And one thing we can do is say those who are, uh, who are committing these gross human rights violations should not be given the privilege of entering into the United States. I want to acknowledge and thank Secretary of State Clinton for taking action against human rights violators. That's the right policy to do. Uh, the legislation that we have authored institutionalizes a process where we deny the right for those individuals to visit and come into the United States. Obviously, that has a price to them. And, it, of course, what we're trying to do is get the government, in this case Russia, to do what's right. The second thing we could do is deal with their financial participation in U.S. institutions. You know, these, these people do get involved in international finance. They do have resources that travel through U.S. financial institutions, and we do have laws that allow us to hold those funds uh, that we, through due process. We can do that. And that is the reason why the legislation that we have talked about today, the, re the legislation that I introduced along with my colleagues, would 
institutionalize those types of changes. For those who think it may not mean much, let me just remind you about what we did uh, when the Soviet Union denied the rights of Jews to be able to leave the country. Here in the United States Congress, we took action by legislation. Many said, would that make any difference? It made a huge difference, and it brought about change in the Soviet Union. Other countries followed our leadership. As both of my colleagues have pointed out, if we act, other countries will act. It will become the norm, and that will help us establish the expectation that countries do need to address tragedies such as Sergei Magnitsky, hold those responsible accountable, and more importantly, take steps so it never happens again. That is what we are attempting to do by moving forward with this legislation. And as, as Senator Wicker said, we, we do urge um, our colleagues to join us in this effort. Senator Wicker, you mentioned what's happening around the, the world as we see uh, countries go through a democratic transformation that we never thought we would see. You saw in our lifetime what happened in Eastern Europe. And now we see some, some really model democracies, our NATO allies, that countries just a few decades ago we thought would be our, our uh, enemies to this day. So we've seen change occur. And we want to be on the right side of this issue, the right side of history, on, on moving forward Russia with the type of reforms that the people of Russia are entitled. We have the right to do that under the Helsinki Act. We have the responsibility to point these issues out, and we can take action that can make a huge difference. So, Mr. President, that is why we are engaged in this discussion today to say, look, we want Russia to do the right thing. We, we want to speak out for the Russian people, uh, and we think that we can play a very important role. The U.S. Helsinki Commission that I have the honor of being the Senate Chair and Senator Wicker is the, the lead Republican on the Senate side. We have a proud history of putting a spotlight on problems. You know, people don't like name calling, but you've got to point out where the violations are occur. Unfortunately, if you don't do it, it becomes statistics. But when you put a face on it and you realize these are people who have families that have been abused because they're trying to do the right thing, you can get action. And that's why I am so proud of the legacy of the U.S. Helsinki Commission and what we've been able to do. This is another chapter in that, in that proud history of saying that we're going to stand up for basic human rights, that that's a priority of our country, and we can do better, and we can do justice for Sergei Magnitsky, and we can do justice for the people of Russia.